right. Hello and welcome to another episode of Around the Horns. I am Aaron. I'm here as always with my co-host Zach. You guys know the drill by now. We are covering everything Texas baseball. Uh, Zach, we're at the dish this weekend. We're at the dish Tuesday night against LSU. We've watched a lot of baseball. Texas finally got to play some home games against some quality teams. Uh, how are you doing? You know, how you doing? Good. You know, I was hoping for a little different result last night, but uh, or the I guess on on Monday, Tuesday night. But you know, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to the nice little road stand, and then after that, it's 14 games in a row, so another long home stand coming up. Yeah, we are going to have a, a lot. We're going to be spending a lot of quality time together in March. I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to have all kinds of fun times in the press box. We are not heading out west to uh, Cal State Fullerton like the rest of the Texas team. That would be quite the trip for us early in the year, but we will be locked in from the couch as usual. Um, Zach, what I want to do today is I want to hit briefly on the Indiana series, talk about what we saw there, uh, talk a little more about that a really, really good game against LSU on Tuesday night. A lot of good pitching, great crowd, great atmosphere. And then uh, we will, of course, preview the series against Cal State Fullerton. We will give some picks, talk about what we're looking for, and then uh, – you know, same thing as usual. We'll hit on some stuff around the country and get out of here. So, Zach, with that being said, Texas took two out of three against Indiana. It did not end that well on Sunday. David Pierce and the rest of the team was very frustrated after the loss on Sunday. But overall, you know, two out of three against, you know, a, a decent Indiana team. You got to take that as far as um, momentum wise and racking up some wins. Um, Friday, definitely the best game of the series. Lucas Gordon, another really good game. The slider looked good. He's doing a lot better getting through the order multiple times, especially that third time around. And then uh, that at, that at bat late in the game with Porter Brown, where we think he's going to bunt, you know, Indiana thinks he's going to bunt, then they're trying to pick off, and then they're trying to run the wheel. David Pierce has changed his mind. Oh, should he bunt? Should I let him swing? He lets him swing. And Porter Brown launches a three-run homer that ends up winning it for Texas. You know, I mean, what, what were you thinking during that crazy at bat on Friday? And just, you know, what stood out to you most about the uh, the series opening win on Friday against Indiana? Yeah, you know, with, with this team, um, even though some of the experienced guys like Porter Brown haven't had a lot of innings under their belt, right? They haven't always been in that situation. So it was really good to see the team stay locked in, stay fighting and grinding out. And then, yeah, I mean, big moment for Porter Brown. Welcome to Austin. That's your that's your call, curtain call right there. Um, he even talked about it. he's he's gotten used to, you know, coming out of the dugout after he hits a home run. But like I said, re really good, solid outing by Lucas. Really impressive. Um you know, the offense is still a work in progress, and I think it will be for a little while. But, um, yeah, Porter Brown, he's he's got a special little bat right there. He just kind of flipped it to oppo, just no big deal. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun talking to him after the game. He was talking about how, you know, I mean, he just kind of got thrown into the fire there in left field as far as the traditions go. I mean, he's got all those hooligans out in left field. You know, he's got to give them the horns up before every game. He's got to – he's their guy. He's their representative. So that comes with the, with the honor and the pressure itself. And then, of course – we got to mention this. Uh, Porter Brown was celebrating the homer and apparently whacked Heston Toll right in the face. Lucas Gordon told us about that. But, uh, you know, I'm sure if you ask Heston Toll, who I believe pitched pitched pretty well in that game, you know, if you know, you, you'll take a whack to the face if it means a game winning three run homer. You know, you'll take one for the team every chance yeah. you get there. So uh, absolutely nothing to complain about. So then uh, we moved to Saturday. You know, Zach, I remember on this show last week we were talking about. Texas and Indiana both showed some struggles on defense um, coming into that series. And we thought defense would play a pretty big part in determining one or two of the games in that series. And that game, it turned out to be Saturday because I believe it was in the fifth inning, but some point in the middle of the game, Indiana made multiple errors in one inning. That's when Texas kind of broke through. Zane Morehouse was pretty solid on the mound, did a little bit of a better job putting guys away with two strikes. But um, Indiana, you know, I'd, I'd hit him with the with the kangaroo gift there in the middle of the game. That ended up being the difference. And uh, Texas was able to make the plays when Indiana wasn't. And they they secured the series on Saturday pretty early there for us. Yeah, the, the defense really kind of let Indiana out of that game. They just, you know, there was a bad take in right field where he literally just like bounced out of his glove. He just completely whiffed on it. Um, and to follow up with the pain they he you know he was first to bat the next inning and immediately strikes out on just a nasty curveball or a slider by uh by Morehouse so yeah I feel for the kid but yeah I mean Indiana really took themselves out of the game and you know Texas didn't play amazing baseball but they they were solid they were clean and that's what you want to see on a Saturday go secure the win and give yourself a, a chance at the series on Sunday 
Yep, absolutely. And on Sunday, they they uh, they had already secured the series, but the Horns were going for the sweep. Um, they did not play as clean on Sunday, especially when it comes to the base pass. You know, we were sitting there in the press box. Everyone saw it. They were getting thrown out on the bases left and right. I believe they made four outs on the bases on Sunday. We didn't exactly know what was going on, and then we got a little bit of a better idea after the game when we talked to David Pierce, and uh, it became very clear that there were some issues with the signs and reading the signs off of the wristbands through which they give the signals. That's not something you see happen very often um, at college baseball level, especially at the D1 level. It's pretty, it was pretty interesting. You know, I mean, Dave Pierce was obviously upset for good reason. They, they really, they could have won that game. They probably should have won that game. Um, you know, the bats didn't pick it up and then they were trying to force stuff on the bases. Didn't really work out, but uh, yeah, it was an interesting scene there after the game on Sunday. Uh, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember the, the first or last time ever I've seen a team immediately just, I mean, you didn't, from the press box, it takes three to four or five minutes if there's traffic to get from the press box to the field. We got to the field, I mean, there was no one. It was a ghost town. Nathan Thornhill's waiting on the radio to talk to a player or Pierce or someone. He's, he's looking around like, yeah, guys, how's it going? I mean, it was ghost town in the dugout. All their stuff was there. Um, and you could tell that, you know, there wasn't, well, I don't know if there was anything yelling went on, but you could tell when they came out of the, out of the clubhouse, it was a somber look. It was not a, okay, yeah, we're, you know, we're, everything's good in la la land. So uh, that was, that was quite interesting. And then obviously Pierce's comments immediately after the game to us, he walked up and just said that was the most embarrassing loss he's had during not only his time at Texas, but maybe the last 35 years. And that, that's crazy. Um, you know, I've heard the, the adjectives from from Augie Garrido around you know being disappointed it's my fault I'm I'm so embarrassed but man to have a, a bomb like that dropped at what seven games into the season is a little worrisome <laughs> yeah it was very interesting because you know we were we were obviously watching the game upstairs in the press box and we were like oh man that, that's a pretty bad loss but then we didn't know all the details of what went on I wasn't expecting most embarrassing loss in the 35 years of coaching. I thought it was like, Oh, this, you know, this is a bad loss game. We probably should have won, but um, yeah. yeah, man, it's tough when, when you mess up the signs on the cards, you know, a lot of times they're just flashing numbers and you, you look at your wristband and perhaps you just look at the wrong column on accident, or you pick up the wrong number from the coach and you're just doing the wrong thing. But yeah, there was a delay steal that I'm starting to think was probably not a delay steal. Um, <laughs> Jared Thomas wasn't able to execute on the hit and run early in the game. Um, just a, just a bad execution game. Um, Travis Staley was, he was, he was fine. You know, he pitched well enough to win, which is what David Pierce said after the game. And I agree with that. Um, it was just pretty good overall, but yeah, it was a missed opportunity there on Sunday. It was definitely a ghost town after the game. You know, there was, we were just standing around. Everyone was just standing around basically. I mean, there were kids hanging out over the railing, waiting for some autographs. No one there. There were a, uh, kids running the bases which happens on Sunday which is you know was pretty ironic we had a good chuckle about that but uh yeah. but yeah I mean it was it was a missed opportunity on Sunday but still a decent series overall against Indiana but um I want to talk about that game on LS versus LSU on Tuesday night of course LSU number one team in the country um just loaded offense really good I mean whenever when you're throwing Thatcher Hurd on a Tuesday night and then you've got Christian Little to come in for the save I mean that is just a very loaded pitching staff which uh which really stood out. But I mean, of all the first round picks on that LSU team, of all the, the amazing pitchers we saw on both sides, LeBaron Johnson Jr., man, he was the guy that stood out the most. I mean, Texas didn't get the win, but five scoreless from LBJ against that LSU lineup. That is, it's not a win, but it is a major win going forward for Texas as uh, they gain a lot of confidence in LBJ for good reason there. Yeah, I mean, anytime you have a, group like Gavin Dugas, Dylan Cruz, Braden Jobert, and Tommy White. So your top four hitters on the lineup, not ex excluding Jared Jones, who's just a freak, right? And then batting 400 at the bottom of yeah. the order. Anytime they have a, what is it? 14, a three for 14 night. Yeah. I mean, you're going to be doing something and, and certainly Duplantia or not Duplantia, but uh, LBJ, LeBaron Johnson, I mean, have yourself a night like that's. I've been on the LBJ train for a long time, and to have see that night was like vindication. This is this yeah. is the dude. this is what we've been waiting for for so long. <laughs> that was that was absolutely some vindication for the for the LBJ truthers out there. I mean, 
you were sitting next to me in the press box. I mean, I was, I was about to have a heart attack in those first couple of innings. He was just, he was coming like, there was one, I mean, there wasn't that bad verse. I think it was Tommy White where it was like, all right, 97 mile an hour fastball, 91 mile an hour slider, 92 mile an hour splitter, 92 mile an hour splitter. I was just like, I was just having a heart attack up there. I was like, what is going on? Like, this is, yeah. I mean, he was making, he was making really good hitters look bad and he was just dominating, which of course, um, I said in the second inning, I was like, this is going to be the last time we see LBJ start on a Tuesday. <laughs> Everyone was thinking it. David Pierce was act about, asked about it after the game. And, um, you know, he didn't say anything for sure, but he made reference to where, yeah, that was that was Friday night stuff. Uh, he's He seems like he's turned a corner there, which begs the question, what, what do we think Texas does with the rotation going forward? Obviously, this upcoming weekend against Cal State Fullerton, we expect it to be the usual Gordon, Morehouse, Staley trio. But then – when you flip it to next week and you have time to like reorganize everything. I don't know, man. I think it's time. I, I think you got to let the peacock fly as they say in the other guys. I mean, I think LBJ it's time to move them to the weekend. It's tough. Uh, if you look at next week, you know, they got a Tuesday, Wednesday matchup. So they got Sam Houston and Mercer on back-to-back days. And so I, I could see one more week or one more start out of LBJ in midweek. I could see them doing like a, a Tuesday night LBJ, a Wednesday night, Charlie Hurley, to get them to the Manhattan series. And then, you know, again, another problem after that is then you have another week with Tuesday, Wednesday. So yeah, I mean, someone's gonna have to sit, someone's gonna have to come in maybe a little shorter rest than normal, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably close to time for LBJ to see some weekend action for sure. Yeah. You make it, you make a really good point about the schedule because the schedule gets really interesting because it's a bunch of home games and the weekend opponents, I believe Texas has Manhattan and new Orleans coming up on the weekends. Yeah. Those those are easier games than maybe like a Sam Houston State or other midweek games that you might be playing in that stretch. So maybe it does make sense to keep LeBaron in that midweek role where he can get, you know, the tougher opponents there. But it's tough because you want him used to a Friday, Saturday routine going into conference play if that's yeah. what you plan to do with him. But it's I mean, the midweek games are going to be different this year because. I mean, Texas is going to need those wins. I mean, last year, you know, obviously you want to win those games. Texas was struggling at times, but there was never any doubt whether that Texas team was going to make the NCAA tournament last year. This year, Texas has this upcoming upcoming stretch to where they could legitimately rip off, you know, 10 to 12 wins in a row if they play good baseball. But the midweek games are going to be a big part of that. So it's definitely a very interesting dilemma. And uh, there's a lot of pieces to navigate there for David Pierce and the coaching staff. But Going back to the specifics in the game, um, you know, as good as LBJ was, the the LSU pitching staff, um, Thatcher Hurd and then uh, Ashcraft there, or Ackenhausen, um, man, they were nasty too. And then you had Christian Little coming in there for the save. I mean, the LSU pitching staff was just as good, and Texas has struggled. You know, Texas has, Texas on offense has struggled with all pitching this year, but especially the elite arms. You know, I'm thinking of Hagen Smith, you know, Devin Fittrell, mm -hmm. um, all those LSU guys, the really elite arms have really overpowered the Texas offense so far. And that was, that was no exception last night with some of those really good LSU arms. Yeah. I mean, the thing I saw last night was from a hitting standpoint, there's guys that are putting really good at bats together. I mean, yeah. Dylan Campbell started the game off by ripping a ball, but I mean, it's right to Trey Morgan in left field. It's too loud outs. Yeah. Two left. I mean, you know, that's a double for him, right? And so I think some of the guys are really hitting the ball well. The problem is it's just not consistent. It's the basis of when you have a guy on, it's always with two outs. When you have a guy in scoring position, it's always with two outs. And so they don't have that leeway right now and the consistency to just generate runs like you would normally see Texas do. And, um, you know, I don't think they're far away necessarily, but I agree with Pierce. I agree with EK after the game. Like they've got work to do and they still need to get it done immediately. Yeah, I mean, you can – the pitching staff has probably performed better than expected to this point, so you don't know how long this uh, this heater is going to last for some of those guys in the bullpen. So it really is time for the for the offense to get it going um, here soon for Texas. Um, the defense, it, it has been better as of late. It obviously was not going to get worse than Arlington. We were pretty confident in that. But um, Eric Kennedy with an awesome throw from center field last night, we were talking about in the press box. Once it left his hand, I was like – Oh man, I think that's money. I could just tell like the way it was tracking and where the runner was on the base. So I was like, I think they might have him here, but yeah, we were talking about it. We're like, that's not really EK's strength, but 
He yeah. moved to center field. He, he scooped up the short hop and he threw a laser to the plate. That was really uh, good to see. The one miscue was uh, Jalen Flores. He, he made a nice play on a hard hit ball. He had all day to throw it. And, uh, you know, he hit Jared Thomas over there with a really tough in between hop who wasn't able to scoop it. That That is one potential issue for Texas just because not that I think Jalen Flores is a, a bad defensive player who can't figure it out, but just in the short term, it, it is going to limit what David Pierce can do with the lineup if he feels he does need to play Tanner Carlson over there at third for defensive purposes. And then you're forced to, you know, do we put Jalen Flores in the DH? Do you just have him sit for a little bit, which you don't really want to do with, with a young player like Flores? Yeah. And, you know, if you do have Carlson play third, then you don't have your best offensive lineup out there from a, from a talent and potential perspective. So that that is one thing that needs to be figured out just because, it would give Texas a lot more lineup flexibility as far as the DH slot and whatnot. If you're able to just pencil Jalen Flores over there at third base. Yeah. I, I, you know, it doesn't help that he's had some good hacks, but they've mostly been right at folks, you know, pop-ups. You know, they sat him the other night. Do they sit him again this weekend? I think, you know, realistically he's the future of, of the corner or even at shortstop, right. They got to get him some time. And so, Pierce probably is willing to just kind of live with some growing pains there. Yeah. And um, I thought it was interesting last night that Max Ballou, the true freshman, also got the start at DH. We know he came in as a known hitter in high school as a prep hitter. Um, you know, he had a, he got, I think, walked the first time up and he didn't look terrible to play, but it's just, where do you find time to get these guys in while still saying we have a season to play? We have to be as competitive as possible. It's it's a tough, it's a tough issue for Pierce in the, in the game. Yeah, that's the dilemma. You want those guys clicking right off the bat because it makes your life easier, but it doesn't always work out that way in the game of baseball. You know, sometimes even the really highly touted guys like uh, Jalen Flores, it could take a little bit of time, but, you, you know, you can't just stick a guy like that on the bench. You got to let him play. Like you said, yeah. he's, he's going to be one of the guys on the team, you know, in, in you know one or two years here. So it's important to get him those reps, but uh, enough looking back. It was a really good performance against LSU. Obviously, the end of the game there. Um, you had some really good bullpen performances from Shaw, Hurley. Um, DJ Burke was really good twice over the past couple of days, but yeah. Chris Stewart lost it there in the ninth. They were forced to bring Duplantier in there in a tough spot. He leaves a fastball over the middle. Just kind of is what it is against a good LSU team. You know, they lost a close game, but let's look ahead here to Cal State Fullerton. Zach, I want you to go ahead and tell everyone a little bit about. Um, you know, what they got going on up there in California and a little bit about uh, some of the hitters we might run into and the type of team and the type of baseball Texas might see this weekend. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's dubbed the Augie series for for good reason, yeah. right? They, they've got four national titles, large part. That was due to Augie's really creating something out of nothing. I mean, it's a kind of a commuter school. It doesn't have football or really a basketball team or anything like that. And so, you know, they they've historically been a baseball club um they've had some tough they've had some rough goes of it really last couple of years um second year head coach he's an alma his alma mater is cal state in fact the entire coaching staff uniquely is all played at cal state or graduated there which is cool um but rpi wise are 186 you know they're two and four on the season they've had a couple of cancellations um they were really, really competitive against Stanford in the opening weekend, and then they really haven't been competitive at all since then against Michigan. And, um, you know, if you look at what they return, though, they actually return a lot of their guys. Seven of the nine are returners from 2022. But again, they only won 22 or 23 games last season. So is that always a good thing? No, not necessarily. Uh, they picked fifth to, big, to be picked fifth in the Big West. So middle of the pack, which is a little unusual. Again, they're not known to being down there it's usually them or uc irvine really battling out for top spot but um they did beat tulane who i think is a pretty decent team in a walk-off fashion that was that was a good mid- midweek game as a team they hit 284 their ea era is 736 though now granted they gave up 21 <laughs> runs into uh, stanford yeah, yeah. but still i mean that's that's not great right and um if you look at their hitters they've actually got some decent names and they're all they're all experienced so Junior right fielder Nathan and Kill, a speed guy. He's hitting 370. Junior first baseman Caden Connor, you know, he's got some power to him. Uh, the sophomore Maddox Lada, and then uh, the senior Zach Lou, you know, they're, they're all sit at the very top of the lineup. That their entire offense runs to those guys. It's about getting the kill on, 
and Connor, a lot of, you know, bunting or batting him over. And so not a lot of power. They've only hit three or four home runs on the season. Uh, now, granted, they have a couple of games canceled, but it's just, you know, kind of your run of the mill offense, nothing, nothing real special or anything. Yeah. I mean, I will note they they played Stanford really tough pretty much that entire series. And, you know, yeah. Stanford is a, is a top five team right now, but um, it's not your prototypical West coast team. You know, usually when I think of Cal state forwards and at least I'm thinking, you know, really good arms that'll be going in the second, third round of the MLB draft where they'll be playing small ball on offense, you know, but, but this team put up a lot of runs against Stanford. The pitching staff has been knocked around a little bit against Stanford and against Michigan. Um, a couple of the guys that um, Texas might be, that, that Texas will be seeing at some point this weekend, their Friday night guy has been the lefty Tyler Stoltz. Um, he is the Austin Todd of West Coast pitchers. He's a, he's a six year senior. Um, you know, he had a good year last year. He was their Friday night guy last year. He had a two nine two ERA and 10 starts. Um, I was watching him earlier today. He's got, he's got a low nineties fastball. He will mix in a slider that is really good. He's got a legit four pitch mix with a slider a curveball change up there to go along with the fastball. Um, he's not a big guy. He's pretty slim. He's not that tall. Um, he hides the ball really well. So I think that mid nineties fastball probably, or the low nineties fastball probably plays a little quicker because, the ball did seem to jump out of his hand a little bit. He hides it really well. I can see him being tough on lefties with that slider. So that'll be something to look for. Um, their typical Saturday guy is Trevor Hinkle. He He's a pretty big righty. He's a strong kid. He runs it up there 94, 95 with the fastball. Um, was watching him earlier. He The fastball is good because it has good run on it. He runs it to his arm side, sinks it a little bit. So it'll play good to the bottom of the zone, which is always nice because you know, when you got the fastball with run, you can expect to get some ground balls. And then when you have the good velocity, you can also expect to get some fly balls. So you can make some guys miss there with the, with the fastball. And then uh, he re- he has a really good 12, six curveball. He likes it a lot. It's pretty sharp. It breaks most of the time. It's a true 12, six where it just breaks vertically. I did see him snap a couple off. I don't know if it was just a slider or he just mixed up the curveball a little bit where it was a little more horizontal break, but most of his best breaking balls are going to be 12, six, pretty sharp right at you. Um, one important thing to note is the scheduling here. They had Cal state Fullerton had some weird weather in the series against Michigan, which caused the games to be pushed to Sunday. So both Stoltz and Hinkle, they both pitched on Sunday as part of a doubleheader. Um, then, then they haven't played since then, you know, Michigan is not, or Cal state has not played since those two games. So, we don't exactly know who the third guy is going to be. We don't exactly know the order of when we're going to see these guys, because like I said, they both pitched on a Sunday. So are they going to want to run their Friday guy out there on a Friday on two days, two days less rest than usual? I don't know. I mean, we'll just have to see, you know, they might do that. They don't really have, probably don't have better options, but um, we'll see those two guys at some point. Just wanted to give a little background there, but yeah, it, it has been a weird week out there, out there in California for those guys. Yeah, they had a Tuesday night game canceled against USC as well due yeah. to heavy rains and the just field conditions. So something to keep an eye out. I actually had not looked at the weather, but now I'm like, oh, well, yeah. what does this do to the Texas series? You know, is it going to be sunny in Cali or is it going to be wet and rainy? I, I don't know. I haven't heard of rain in California in a while. So, um, yeah, one thing I saw, noticed about Trevor, though, is, you know, he didn't have a great year at Pepperdine last year. Um, it was, you know, it was all right. But one of the things I saw was hitters – he typically leaves them a little flat, his fastball. They have good run, but they're a little flat on the horizontal plane. And so, um, you know, hitters are able to get around it and kind of knock them about. So that'd be interesting to see, um, you know, a hard throwing righty that doesn't have a ton of movement, What how the, the Texas batters get, a, get along. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was talking about the best quality of those guys, but I will point out, um, you know, they've been hit around a little bit. They both got hit around versus Michigan, you know, Stanford hits around a lot of teams. So um, there, there should be an opportunity there, but I think this stuff was pretty good from both of those two guys. So I think this will be um, pretty good matchups there out in California. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the rain. Um, I believe we have an eight o'clock first pitch local time on Friday night. So yeah, hoping we don't get a rain delay there um, or else we could be getting a, a game recap from me around, you know, two in the morning, which might not be fun for uh, anyone involved, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Hopefully the rain holds off. Um, Zach, it is only Wednesday when we are recording this, but let's go ahead. Uh, let's go ahead and make some picks here. I will say you had a sweep against Indiana. You were very close. Um, the sign cards betrayed you. You know, nothing you can do there. Can't You got to control. I, I 14 control. font. <laughs> yeah. 
if, if it were if they would have just upped the font size, Zach probably would have gotten his prediction right. I ended up picking uh, Texas to win that series ultimately, but uh, you know I was a little wishy washy. Uh, what do you have this weekend against Cal State Fullerton? Yeah, I, I went back and forth also in a bunch. You know, I at first I had one and two. Yeah, first two road tests. There's a lot of freshmen on a plane for the first time traveling. It's it's a bit of a short week due to the travel out to California. You know, there's going to be an, a, a little bit of an emotional letdown after LSU. I don't care if it's a confidence boost or not. You know, at the end of the game, you're sad because you just you waste an opportunity against number one, right? Um, barring any schedule irregularities due to weather, I think Texas goes two and one this weekend. And, you know, I could see Lucas doing really, really well against this this lineup. I worry about the other two just in terms of are they going to be consistent enough on the road? Um, but I do think they get a series win. I think that Texas is holistically a better team than, than Cal State Fulton, especially with the pitching. Yeah, I do think Texas is probably the better team if you play this over a large sample size. This is a unique series for both teams with Cal State Fulton having not played since Sunday and kind of having mm-hmm. all their pitching schedules thrown off. But then at the same time, you do have Texas – getting getting on a plane for the first time with a with a true road trip all the way out west after you know a unique Tuesday night game where you use all your best bullpen arms and yeah. you know you had you had the number one team in the country on the ropes there I'm gonna go one and I'm gonna go I'm gonna say Texas goes one and two just because I think it's such a weird series I feel more comfortable taking the home team um I don't know how long this bullpen heater is gonna last you know I mean I, it might not be a heater. You know, I, th- I think this is a good time where we we give a shout out or give some credit to the new pitching coaches. I mean, Woody Williams and Chris Gordon. I mean, they have they seem to have done some work with guys like LBJ, um, DJ Burke, uh, David Shaw. I mean, all those guys are, are pitching really well, um, you know, better than some people would have expected coming into the year. So if those guys can keep it up and keep being really efficient and, you know, pretty clutch out of the bullpen, then I think Texas has a good shot. I'm, I'm going to say one and two just because I think it's a coin flip series and I, I'd rather take the home team just in this unique spot with Texas coming off the LSU game and then, you know, going out West for the first time this year. Yeah. LBJ did mention after the game, he said, Woody Williams has helped me a lot having that MLB mindset, yep. knowing that I have to go attack. And I think you saw that, right? The first inning, he was hitting 93, 94 on his fastball. Second, third inning, He's jumping up 95, 96, 97. I know the analytics guys said he hit 98. I don't know if they were rounding up, but I mean, yeah. he just, he continued to get a little stronger, a little stronger in attack. So yeah, it's, it's something else. And then, you know, everyone complained about pitching last year and it certainly was an issue. Um, if you look at the season ERA last year, it was 428. This year right now it's 315. So there is some improvement so far. I mean, it's a long season to go, but signs of improvement. Yeah, no, I mean, the pitching has been better than expected now. It's just kind of up to the offense to to pick it up a little bit and see if this can become a more well-rounded team. I will say, um, I don't want to talk too much long-term. You know, we have a we have a lot of time to project about the full season. But if, if you potentially do get LBJ cooking on a weekend roll with Lucas Gordon pitching well with the new slider, you know, all of a sudden you've got a pretty formidable weekend rotation there that can really give good lineups some, some troubles when those guys are on. So... I think the potential there is pretty good if when you when you talk about just what LBJ has been able to do and what Lucas Gordon has been able to do multiple times through the lineup with the new slider. Um, all right, Zach, you, you got any update for us for, uh, you know, any any teams that stood out to you this past weekend? Um, there's a team, uh, I think Portland Port. Yeah, I, I think Port, they, they come to mind. They, they won some pilots. Portland. I forget who they beat. They were they were on the road. Um, I think it was an it was an SEC team they were going up against a powerhouse that's many national championships. Yeah, it wasn't like it wasn't the nicest SEC town. Um, <laughs> it it was kind of gross on the broadcast. Um, there were there were bubbles that was weird. I don't know if it was close to some sort of amusement or or children's park, <laughs> but Portland was able to take down some SEC team. Uh, you know they they almost had the sweep. So you know that caught my eye. I don't know if that caught your eye, but you know, that, that, that stood out to me, you know, I don't know. So I think what caught my eye more than A&M losing two out of three to Portland at home and needing a walk-off on Sunday to avoid a sweep. Yep. Uh, is the fact that 
the head coach, Slosnickel, who I think the, I think he's a great coach. I mean, he's he's a magician, right? What he did at TCU, what he's done at AM. He has some amazing assistant coaches. But the post-game interview, if you haven't seen him, where he's calling out the fans at AM saying, I don't know what's going on here. Wow. What's going on? You're losing to Portland. That's what's going wow. on. I can that's, answer that's that one for you. <laughs> um, yeah, apparently Coach Sloss was not happy with, with the fans heckling his boys uh, on Tuesday night's game against, I think, Houston Christian it was, uh, where they run-ruled them 23 to nothing, but still getting heckled. So. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we all know the old saying, you know, if you can't take the heat, don't schedule weekend series against the Portland Pilots, you know. That's just how it goes. Yeah. Um, but no, outside of that, you know, uh, Baylor is in some trouble. They are bad, like historically D1, D1 bad. They've given up 20, 40, 50, 60 runs over the last four games. 60. Uh, yeah. And it's against Duke and UTSA. Yeah, it's not pretty. Uh, Texas yeah, Tech, not- I guess I should have never questioned Tadlock because the moment I did, of course, they're on a 9-0 heater. Uh, they're just running through everyone and, them, and their mother. Uh, and it's not like they played anyone amazing. Like, Gonzaga's a solid opponent, but wow. Did not expect that. Oklahoma State is uh, schizophrenic. They they win 11-1. to The next night, they give up 10 runs. The next night, they give up 10 runs and lose. Like, I can't keep track of these guys. They're all over the place. Um, yeah, the Big 12 is just all a bunch of jumble right now. It's all crazy. Um, but some series to watch this weekend. There's actually a lot of really good baseball going on. So DBU plays Southern Miss. That'll be a really fun series. Uh, South Carolina plays Clemson. Those big rivalries down in the South are always interesting. Clemson's been bad, but uh, and South Carolina's been just mashing homers. But could be fun. You know, you never know what's going to happen. Um, the Miami Florida series. I, I think Florida's going to absolutely go crush. You know, just give the golden spikes to Jack. That dude is was seven home runs. He throws ninety seven. Like amazing amazing um but then the big uh the big one is down in in uh houston actually for the shriners classic so yeah the shriners yeah so a&m plays louisville which would be interesting tcu plays louisville and then texas tech plays a&m so i want to see if a&m and tech are for real like go battle each other maybe they'll fall into the ocean i don't know but um some good baseball right so it'll be a lot of a lot of fun watching this weekend yeah, it's always fun to see the storylines develop just all around college baseball um, as early in the season. You know, you've got the Florida guy you mentioned just throwing gas, hitting bombs. Um, you know, you've got Texas Tech out of nowhere. Gavin Cash just keeps – he continues to rake. Um, you know, A&M and Oklahoma just losing the random teams. You know, you, you just hate to see that. Um, yeah, the Baylor thing is interesting, Zach. If I had any eligibility left, um, I would stretch for about a year – and then I would get my laptop and I would send an email to the coaching staff and, you know, see if they were interested in, you know, upper, upper seventies fastballs with, with a, with a mid fifties ethos and, uh, you know, see if, see if I had anything to offer the old bears, but um, not, not really looking to do that right now. They probably still would reject my services, which I understand, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's been an interesting year. I mean, Texas isn't the only team struggling right now, but, the, the offense needs to get going. I mean, it'll be it'll be fun to watch this weekend. I'm excited for the series against um, Cal State Fullerton. And I'm excited for the for the lighter stretch, not as far as quantity of games, but as far as quality of opponent. I mean, I'm excited to see if Texas can get some young guys hot, get, build some confidence with some wins, with some big innings. Um, that'll all be interesting to watch. But uh, I mean, yeah, you got anything else you want to hit on before we uh, before we get out of here on this on this Wednesday? Only thing I was going to add is that we didn't mention it earlier during the Indiana series, but if you if you missed your post on Instagram or on Twitter, yeah, go check out the absolutely ridiculous flying slash diving throw by Garrett Guillemet, where the guy bunted down the first baseline and he just like throws himself into the air like Patrick Mahomes to make the throw. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's it's absolutely a wonderful throw. Yeah, I've referenced it a couple of times. I tweeted it live, and then when they you know. Um, whoever's doing the video and the pictures down there at that moment in the Texas dugout got a really great shot of, of the Garrett Guillemet play. He legitimately did the whole Patrick Mahomes thing where he had both feet off the ground, was horizontal, he was parallel to the ground, 
and just let it loose on the money. Uh, that was an outstanding play. Um, yeah. It's been some, there's been some fun plays on defense lately. It's still, I, I've enjoyed watching the games, even with the, with the up and down start, which was to be expected. But um, yeah, I mean, we're, you know, regardless, we're going to be coming at you guys on YouTube every single week. So feel free to um, leave us some comments. You can give some questions or some, you know, what you think about this team in the season so far. Um, give us some likes, subscribe to the Orange Bloods YouTube channel. There's all kinds of content going out all the time. Check us out. Check out all our written stuff on orangebloods.com. You know, all kinds of great stuff over there as well. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow me at Aaron Little OB. You can follow Zach at Zach at the dish. Um, we both have a lot to say throughout all the games throughout the week. Um, yeah, I mean, with that, I think uh, I think I'm ready to get out of here. I hope everyone enjoys the week and um, take a nap on Friday. You know, take a nap when you get home from work on Friday, so you're up for some late night West Coast baseball. And uh, with that, I think we will see everyone uh, next week. Looking forward to it. Hook them. <laughs>